this subject matter is so near and dear to my heart, of course, that lies at the very essence of creating peace and serenity, is really learning to uh, live in the moment, learning to keep your attention in the moment. The power of staying in the moment is one of those topics that is clearly easier to discuss in its absence. So often our minds are somewhere other than where we are, you know, we're off in the future worrying about this and that and how awful it's going to be and anticipating problems and concerns and worries and running through future conversations in our mind. Or, of course, we're focusing on our past and we're thinking about last quarter's poor performance or the argument that we had this morning or whatever. And it's so insidious that we're everywhere but right where we are. It's almost like amazing to me. It's almost like we're one step removed from life. We're never quite here. We're always anticipating the next thing or worrying about something that's already over. Sometimes when I lose my bearings and I've got an awful lot of things to do and I start getting concerned about the growing list of responsibilities and things that I have to attend to, my wife will remind me that, Rich, what you try and teach people is that if you just do one thing at a time, it usually works out pretty well, doesn't it? And, of course, she's right. That's the essence of it is that, you know, if you have nine things to do on your to-do list today and you focus on how many there are and how you'll never get it done and you're looking forward to the next one and uh, it's just going to seem overwhelming, you know. It's just going to seem like this big burden and all these problems that you have to attend to. But, you know, life is just really one thing after another. And if you're just engage in the phone conversation and then deal with the problem and then have the conflict and then go out to lunch with the client and then you do this and then you do that. If you just do one thing at a time, it's amazing how much easier your life will seem if you just stop anticipating how difficult it is going to be. You know, therapists, of course, are masters at bringing us into the past. They will uh, encourage us. We'll talk about, oh, God, my childhood was so terrible and all this. And then they'll say something like, um, well, can you talk about other things in your childhood that were difficult? And in a sense, they're encouraging us, many of them, not all of them, of course. And i got to be careful when I talk about therapists because most of my friends are therapists. But there's this tendency to uh, bring us back to somewhere that no longer exists other than in our imagination. It's true our past existed. But right now in the moment, it only exists in your imagination. And it's just an incredible gift to be able to bring your mind back to this moment. You know, our minds are a lot like a puppy. It's always wandering forward or wandering backwards, wandering sideways. We could actually train ourselves by just simply catching it and, and, and bringing our attention back to the moment. Navigating your thinking is about knowing when your thoughts are getting the best of you. Um, I'd like to talk again for just a moment about how you can be driving in your car or you're at the office or you're in the shower or you're taking a walk and you're having these conversations going on inside your own head. And sometimes these conversations, of course, are helpful, but a lot of times they're very self-defeating. They are things like, oh, I'll never get all this work done or I can never come up with an answer or my life is going nowhere. And we have all these conversations going on all the time in our heads. When you learn to navigate your thinking, what I'm referring to is catching yourself when you're engaging in this busy-minded, negative self-dialogue that's going on inside your head. You learn to detect when you're doing that. You learn to feel it. You know, um, there's this incredible connection between your thinking and the way you feel. So that when you feel uptight or you feel stressed out, it kind of tips you off to let you know that you're thinking in some way dysfunctional. So when you want to navigate your thinking, you kind of check in with your thinking and you discover almost universally that if you're feeling stressed out, that implies that in some way you are thinking negatively. You are thinking in a self-defeating way. You learn to back off of those thoughts. And when you back off of those thoughts, you catch yourself. You say things like, oops, there I go again. I'm going to back off of this type of thinking. It's not leading me somewhere I want to be going. And as you back off, it allows new thoughts to come to the surface, to percolate, and to serve you well. This is one of those topics that I don't know anyone who's fully mastered it. Certainly not I. In fact, I'll tell you what I think is a kind of a cute story about that. I was with my wife and two children, and we were driving up to see somebody. And the previous trip had been several months before, and I'd had a very rare argument with this particular person. And um, we're driving up this long driveway, and I said to my wife, Chris, I said, you know, I know what's going to happen when we 
when we get there, I'm going to say this, and he's going to say that, and I'm going to say this, and he's going to respond by saying that. And I played this out for a little while. And Chris looked over at me, and she said, well, you know, Rich, if you're determined to have a really lousy time, can't you just at least wait till you get there? And, of course, my kids started laughing at me, and Chris and I started chuckling, and it reminded me once again how important it is to not anticipate things. You know, public speaking is a fear that a lot of people have. It's, it's uh, In fact, I saw a study once that the um, number one fear in America is public speaking uh, ahead of death and flying. As I was kind of surprised by that. But when you talk to people who do public speaking, and I do a lot of that now, uh, what many of us will say is that actually speaking is, is very effortless. It's really not hard at all. It's anticipating speaking. It's thinking about what could go wrong or how I might not think of what to say and I, my mind might go blank or what if I blow it or what if I forget this topic or what if this happens or what if I faint. And um, in fact, incidentally, I fainted twice doing public speaking when I was a youngster and uh, lucky to have gotten over that fear. But um, this whole idea of staying present and realizing that this anticipatory thinking is really the problem. And when you notice yourself in this type of thinking, anticipating problems and concerns, all you have to do is recognize it. You say, whoops, there I go again. I'm doing it again. You gently bring your mind back to the present. And all of a sudden you realize that, you know, right now, in this moment, life is really not as bad as I had been imagining it that it was. You know, life as it exists in this moment is fine. I'm just doing what I'm doing. Uh, it's the problem exists when we really start milking those future moments in our mind. We really start dramatizing them and thinking about how horrible everything's going to be. So this is a, a, a big problem that can be overcome quite easily and really lies, I think, at the heart of finding peace and serenity in your life. One of my best friends and co-author of our joint book, Slowing Down to the Speed of Life, Joe Bailey, says that speed has become our god. And uh, to certainly to some degree that is true, that we've got all these time-saving gadgets and we're always in a hurry, we're always trying to improve our pace and efficiency, so much so that it, you know, you get in line at McDonald's or something and, and people are annoyed that they have to wait three minutes you know, for their, for their dinner, for their family of six or something. It's gotten to the point where people are just such in a hurry all the time. So many things happen when we learn to live at what I will call a sane pace. You know, there is an optimal pace for everything. There's an optimal pace for your car. If you drive your car too fast, if you rev it up too much, it damages the engine. If you drive it too slow, it's not good for it either. And it's the same way in life, that we have an optimal pace, a pace that serves us really well. Anybody who goes too fast, you lose your bearings and all sorts of things happen to you. You make a lot of mistakes and, and whatnot. If you go too slow, you become ineffective as well. But specifically, the reasons that it's important to slow down to the speed of life is that, first of all, you're going to have an incredible reduction in the stress that you feel. Being in a hurry and always rushing around is incredibly stressful. You know, I don't know anybody who's ever... Uh, disputed beyond this fact that when you're rushing around, you're in a hurry, you're behind schedule, you're juggling everything, you just start to fumble. You make a lot of mistakes and it's very, very stressful. Um, it's also incredibly helpful to your physical health, at least from my understanding. And remember, I'm not a doctor, but uh, most of my acquaintances who are doctors will agree with that, that when you slow down, uh, it helps you relax. It um, allegedly lowers your blood pressure and your pulse and it allows you to become a calmer person that's less agitated and less bothered and doesn't get offended as easily. You know, when you're juggling a lot of balls and you're rushing around, everything seems to bother you and um, your physical health suffers as well. You're bumping into things, you're going too fast, you're probably drinking too much coffee, you're, you're doing everything to get yourself all hyped up and, and um, living at a heightened pace. But when you really slow down a little bit, um, you become a more relaxed person and you're able to um, take care of yourself a little bit better. Also, without question, when you slow down to the speed of life, you become much more present, uh, much more intimate, and you're able to be much clearer and purer in your intimate relationships. You're able to really be right there with people. You know, I've said this once before, but it's worth repeating that when you're with someone and your mind is somewhere else, the person that you're with senses that. They really know that, that you're in a hurry. You're looking at your watch. You wish you were somewhere else. You're, you're running out the door. But if you can just slow down a little bit, 
people will feel that too. They'll realize that, hey, life's not an emergency. Um, this person has time for me. I know my kids, one of the goals that I have with my kids is that I really want to teach them and I think I'm doing a pretty good job with that, that there's plenty of time for them. And you know, you can even do this when you're in a hurry. You take just a couple of extra seconds sometimes to stop before you rush out the door, to hold them, to pick them up, give them a kiss, give them a hug. When they say, oh, you're running out the door, say, no, no, there's plenty of time. You know, just be there for just a couple of extra minutes or a couple of extra seconds. It makes all the difference in the world in your relationships. Obviously, uh, another advantage is that you have an increased and heightened sensory awareness of everything beautiful that's going on around you. Of course, the old adage, uh, slow down to smell the roses or to smell the flowers, is certainly true. You know, when you're rushing around, um, it's amazing to me. I've, I've actually been in businesses and in corporations where I would um, look out the window of the person I was with and I'd say, wow, isn't that a beautiful view of the um, San Francisco Bay Area or whatever? And the person is so speeded up that they said, wow, I, I've actually never even noticed that I had a view. And this might be someone who's been in the office for six years, but they're rushing around. They, they never have time to look out the window. People do this because it becomes a habit and they think they're being very effective and they're getting a lot done. But, you know, most of us are willing to admit that when we're rushing around frantically, a lot of times we're just spinning our wheels. We're not living at that optimum pace or operating at... Uh, a very high RPM, as it were, and it's just not the uh, most effective way to live. Certainly can't enjoy the beauty around you when you're rushing. I was in Hawaii not too long ago speaking at a conference, and um, this family, I believe, had just gotten to the same hotel we were at, and the uh, husband, the, the father of the three kids and the husband of this wife, they were in an incredible hurry to go home. And they had just gotten there. They were in a hurry to run down to the beach to have some fun. They were in a hurry to get up to the restaurant. I mean, I don't know what the hurry was. You're in Hawaii, you know, but these people were in a hurry and they're rushing around. And they were not looking at the beauty around them. It was, it was unbelievable to me. But as I looked around, I noticed a lot of other people were in a hurry too. You'd think if, if in anywhere you were going to relax, it would be Hawaii. But not so in this particular case. You know, you see a lot of people rushing around. And when you rush around, you can't notice the ocean or the trees or the waterfall or, the, or whatever is around you. You just don't see it. When you slow down, it allows you to become more reflective, to enjoy your life more, to feel that sense of peace, and to recognize that life is not the emergency that we can sometimes make it out to be. And finally, it's also important to slow down to the speed of life because it dramatically improves your ability to be productive and creative and to stay focused. It really allows you to see right to the heart of the matter. It allows you to operate at an optimum pace where you're not spinning your wheels, where you're not repeating mistakes. You know, we've all had that experience of thinking through a problem five, six, seven times, and yet we're not getting an answer because we're just so speeded up and we're in such a hurry that we can't see the obvious. So often when I have a decision to make or a title to come up with or a chapter title or whatever I'm working on or a, a theme for a talk, if I just quiet down, slow down, what happens is it allows the answer to come to me. Most of us are a lot more creative and clever and brilliant than we give ourselves credit for. It's just that we're so speeded up that we can't ever find those answers. But when you slow down, it's as if those answers just come right to you and they come right to the forefront of your mind. I mentioned earlier that human beings have two distinct modes of thought. We have our analytical thinking, and I've never met a person who would question the value of analytical thinking. We need it to survive. It's incredibly important for certain types of problem solving and learning something new or balancing your checkbook or coming up with a statistics analysis or an economics forecast or something like, like this. But the other type of thinking that we have is more free-flowing, and that's what I'll call the free-flowing mode. And again, what this is, is the opposite. It's almost like our minds are like a walkie-talkie. You're either on talk or listen. You're either in free-flowing mode or you're in analytical thinking. The idea in analytical thinking, of course, is to fill your head with data, to think about things, to try hard, to figure out your life. In free-flowing mode, what you're doing is you're emptying your mind. You're allowing it to settle. You're allowing yourself to quiet down. And as you quiet down, this new type of thinking 
pops into your mind, you are thinking, you're not turning off your mind, you are thinking, but in a new way, in a more passive way. And um, this type of thinking has an incredible transcendent intelligence that just does its thinking for you. And so, for example, if you need to um, remember where you left your keys, if you quiet down, oftentimes it will just pop into your mind, or you forget someone's phone number, it will pop into your mind, or you need a great idea to solve a particular problem at work. If you just quiet down, tell yourself what you need, your thinking will be done for you. You'll come up with an idea. So your free-flowing mode is incredibly powerful. The way to access it is to just simply understand that it exists and to begin to trust in it, to understand that you are a thinking being, whether or not you're actively thinking. So it's almost like a form of active meditation where you just quiet down, slow down your thinking, take your mind off of your problems, and you'll discover some incredible answers coming into your life. Remember, the free-flowing mode will always give you the answers you need. Early in my career, I was incredibly blessed by participating in four separate anthologies. And for those of you who aren't aware of what an anthology is, an anthology is a collection of work where a bunch of different people, in this case authors, come together to discuss one common theme. And a couple of the book titles were Handbook for the Soul and Handbook for the Heart and Healers on Healing and For the Love of God. And we interviewed some of the most remarkable people on the face of this earth, people like the Dalai Lama and Mother Teresa and Thomas More and Wayne Dyer and just some incredible people who have attained this sense of peace and serenity that we're talking about. And probably the most fascinating part of the process of putting together these projects was that almost without exception, from the Dalai Lama to Mother Teresa to everyone else we talked to, said essentially the same thing. And what they said was that, you know, we have the same chatter and concerns in our minds as everybody else. The only difference is that we don't pay as much attention to it. And I was trying to picture the Dalai Lama having, <laughs> having troublesome thoughts in his mind, and I couldn't quite see it. But in a way, it makes sense. You know, they, they, and they said this in different ways, by the way. They didn't all come right out and say it exactly like that. But when you read what they had to say and when you were talking to them and interviewing them, it became very clear that, that everybody has insecure thoughts. Everybody has doubts. Everybody has wishes that aren't coming true. Everybody has problems. Everybody worries about things. Some people, perhaps most of us, focus on those worries and those thoughts. Other people, some of the people in these anthologies, have learned to dismiss those thoughts. They see them as thoughts. They don't see them as reality. They just see them as passing thoughts, and they'll acknowledge them and they'll let them go. And when you learn to let them go, that's where you find peace and serenity, because the thoughts won't hang around very long when you don't give them a lot of attention. So I know that these days, if I'm having doubts about an ability to, to write or do a, a public lecture or something, I'll just acknowledge the thoughts are there, and I'll say, oh, there's, there's some more to deal with. You know, I'll just let them go. And I know I'll always have them, but I also know I don't have to give them a great deal of significance in my mind. So these people uh, were incredible examples to me of people that have attained a uh, heightened sense of peace and serenity. I have a number of friends in my life, uh, personal friends, one pr friend in particular who's a yoga teacher who is exactly like this. Um, things just don't get to him. He's highly productive. He runs a very effective and successful yoga school. He loves his life. He loves his wife. He loves uh, everything that life brings him. And yet he's just so serene and so peaceful. And it's not put on. It's very real. I've learned a lot from him over the years. And, and I think that I'm beginning to get a taste of what that peace and serenity feels like. I know that when I feel it, I don't want to give it back quickly. And I think the more peace and serenity that you experience, the easier it will be to let go of those thoughts that interfere with that serenity. Probably the two steps that are most important if you've lost perspective about staying in the moment, if your mind is drifting here and there and you just can't seem to get centered, the first would be to have faith in the free-flowing mode of thinking that I discussed a little earlier. And again, just to recap, the free-flowing mode is when you quiet down 
And there's this tendency that we all have, or that many of us have, to believe that when we quiet down, we're shutting off our minds, that we're not really thinking, that our minds aren't active enough. And this really isn't true. When you quiet down the chatter in your mind, and you tune inward, and you allow your mind to be at rest, your mind is still working. In fact, it's working very hard. The difference is you're not trying very hard. It allows you to quiet down, to reflect, to come up with answers, sometimes answers that are new, almost out of the blue. You ever had an answer come to you that surprises you? Usually that does not come from racking your brain. It usually comes from quieting down and relaxing and allowing an answer to come to you. So when you've lost your centeredness, when your, your mind's drifting here and there, if you just quiet down and allow your mind to, to rest, you'll find that you'll be able to bring yourself back to the moment. The other major problem that many of us experience is that we're so preoccupied with our problems and our worries and our concerns that we can't stay present because we're always operating in the what-if mode. We're, well, what if this happens and what if that happens and we have to prepare for this and I have to prepare for that and don't want to repeat that mistake because that was a really tough one, you know, and so our minds are always um, spinning toward all these concerns that we have. One of the things you can do, and probably a very important step you can take in bringing your mind back to the moment, is to put those problems on what's called the back burner. And a lot of people have heard of this concept, but many people um, fail to use it very often. And what the back burner is, is that simply a, a technique that people use to come up with answers or to store their problems where they belong on the back burner of your mind. The back burner of your mind is very much like the back burner of a stove. It's still on but oftentimes you create a more delicious spaghetti sauce or soup by using the back burner than you do by you know, turning it on full blast and cooking it quickly. Your mind's the same way. If you have a problem or a concern, you can say to yourself, okay, I need to keep this problem in mind, but I'm going to put it in the back burner of my mind. I'm going to put it in the background. I need an answer by tomorrow about this problem, but rather than thinking about it and analyzing it and getting all caught up in it, you can put it on the back burner, therefore giving it time to percolate, giving it time to settle. And you'll find that that will bring you back to the moment. It'll allow you to have those answers that you need. And it will also activate that part of your mind so that those solutions that you're asking for will actually present themselves in due time. So these are some of the best ways to bring yourself back to the moment when you somehow gotten off track. I like to think of peace and serenity as our actual, the way that we are intended to be. And the only thing that interferes with that are the negative, self-defeating thoughts that we tend to pay attention to. You know, it's interesting, almost every thought is a potential fork in the road. You know, you can wake up in the morning and you can start having thoughts about your day and thoughts about your gratitude and about how wonderful things are and some of the activities of the day will start going through your mind. You might turn on the news or read the newspaper and then you have a series of thoughts that run through your mind about, oh my gosh, I forgot to call Mike or I forgot to call Deborah and um, boy, they're going to be so mad at me and I didn't finish that work and I've got all this work coming up today and boy, it's going to be a difficult day. And you can see, just as I'm speaking, you can just probably feel the hyper energy that goes into that. Here you were having a pleasant morning, and then all of a sudden, you have a series of thoughts. When you begin to have that series of thoughts, you're at what's called a fork in the road. You can go with those thoughts, you can take them seriously, you can play into them, you can follow it to its logical conclusion, or you can say to yourself, aha, uh -huh, here's another fork in the road. I'm not going there. In fact, one of the most popular sayings in um, our culture today is, is sort of a, a fad, I suppose, but it's the three words, don't go there. And I always like to use those words to myself. I'll be doing fine, and all of a sudden I'll get a series of uh, very panicked, frightened thoughts run through my mind, and I'll start to go there, and all of a sudden I'll remember, uh-uh, this is a fork in the road. I have a choice. This concept of having forks in the road implies that you do have a choice. You can go there, you can follow that train of thought, or you can back off and you can say, I know what's going to happen if I follow that train of thought. It's going to lead me to only one place, and that's the emotional dump. And I've been there before, and I'm not going to allow myself to do it. And again, you can see that everything's potentially that way. You can, people go off on all sorts of tangents in their minds, and it doesn't really matter what your particular train of thought happens to be. 
The question is whether or not you really want to follow that train of thought. And if you don't, you have the capacity to give it less significance and to back off of your thinking. There are many activities that we can participate in that can assist us in our quest for more peace and serenity. But I think even more importantly, and I will mention a couple, but I want to preface it by saying that it's not so much the activity, it's the mindset that you bring to the activity. You know, there are people that um, will take a yoga class and it drives them crazy. There are other people that take a yoga class and it saves their life. Uh, if it were the yoga class that was going to save you, then it would do the same for everybody. It's not the class itself. Same thing with meditation. Meditation is a wonderful activity for some people. Some people just absolutely can't sit still. So something like running might be a better method for them. There are certain careers that people engage in that would just be so nourishing. Like, I love to write. When I write, it's like, to me, it's like taking a meditation class. I just am so filled up with um, energy and loving thoughts and inspiration when I sit down to write. Other people, when I say that, they almost feel like vomiting because they, they just think, how can you sit there for hours and hours and, and tap away on a little laptop computer that just sounds nauseating, you know? And some of my best friends just think, what are you doing? Uh, reading for some people is like myself. I love to read. I just love to curl up with a book and sit on the couch and read for hours. And, and other people just would rather watch television, you know? So it's important to know that it's not really the activity. That being said, there are certain things that tend to bring out the best in people. Um, spiritual reading, peaceful reading, books that de-emphasize drama and emphasize peace and serenity. Certain classes, reflective thinking, deep breathing, yoga, meditation tend to really bring out those qualities in people as well. Finally, something that I always suggest to people is that they take at least a little quiet time every day to nourish their own spirit, whether it's 10 or 15 minutes in the morning before work or after work, or whether it's, as I used to do, stopping the car five minutes before I got home at night just to sit and look at the view before I went into the house and got um, tackled by my small children. You know, so you can find creative ways to get some quiet time in areas that you might not have thought possible, but really try to take that quiet time because if you do, you'll find that it enriches your life in immeasurable ways. Something that has been incredibly helpful in my life, both personally and professionally, is my insistence on getting up very early in the morning. I've often been asked, how in the world um, have you been able to write so many books? It seems like you write about a book a year, and my trick has always been to get up very early in the morning. And when I say early, I mean like three to four o'clock in the morning, almost every day. And there's something so magical about getting up early before the hustle and bustle of the day when it's still dark and there's nothing going on in the house, your family's asleep, the phone's not ringing, nobody's asking you to do anything, and there's all this peace. I've always used this time to meditate or to read inspirational literature, to reflect, to just sit and enjoy a quiet cup of coffee, to read, and of course to work. And everyone, of course, has different tolerances and needs for sleep, but I've always felt that I'd rather get one less hour of sleep and have this time for myself because so many people tell me that you know, they get up in the morning and it's, it's off to the races. You know, you're, you get up and you're already behind schedule. You've gotten that extra 15 or 20 minutes of sleep, but now you've got to jump in the shower, you gulp down some coffee, you grab a donut, you jump in the car, you get in the traffic, and people say all the time, I have no time for yoga. You must have more time than me, Rich. And uh, I'll say, well, I doubt I have more time than you. The last time I checked, uh, everybody has the same 1,440 minutes in a day. But the question is, how do you want to use that time? And of course, some people might require a lot more sleep than I do, and I'm certainly open to that. And it may not be worth the trade-off, but it's certainly worth considering. Because by the time you get up and start your day, if the phone's ringing and people are asking you things and there's lots of chaos going on, it's very difficult to find the time to do some of these more nurturing activities. Probably won't come as a surprise to you that in most spiritual traditions, it's encouraged to get up early, to pray, or to meditate, or to have some silent time, to really take advantage of that time of the day, which is a very special time. You can get a lot of things done, and you can, more importantly, have a lot of quiet. I believe that the most effective way to create miracles of serenity in your life is to trust a quieter mind. It's so difficult to trust that quiet mind because 
we all think that we have to be doing something with our mind. We have to be solving our problems. We have to be very active in the process. So we get so caught up in our thinking and we get caught up in the details of our thoughts, for example. So we'll think about something that's bothering us. And we've all heard the story of something as simple as the way someone squeezes the toothpaste and how that drives someone crazy when in fact the toothpaste has obviously very little if anything to do with the person being upset. It's all the obsessive thinking about it and how it must be directed at me and how important this is and there must be other things and you start thinking about it and getting into the details and and focusing on all the specific aspects of why you're upset and why you have a right to be upset and you know how often people are wronging you and all this kind of nonsense. I think it's really um, important to ask yourself the question, will this matter a year from now? I mean, 99.9% of the things that you worry about probably won't matter a year from now. Occasionally something will matter a year from now. I know that's true, but for the vast, vast majority of things, it really won't matter a year from now. And in fact, most people tell me that when they implement that bit of wisdom into their life, they'll uh, write me a letter and they'll say, you know what, Rich, you're actually... Um, understating that point because most things won't matter um, six or seven hours from now. We're very concerned about something that happens, but again, life is just one thing after another, and within a matter of, of hours, you're usually onto something else. And so all this obsession with the details of what you're concerned about doesn't really serve you. And these are all the ways that we compound. We turn a little problem into a big problem. That was really the essence of the whole don't sweat the small stuff philosophy that I've always had. And that is that you take a little thing and you just make it into a great big deal. And so many of us do this and it just behooves us to stop doing that so much. So if you can learn to trust a quieter mind and you can realize that your mind is still working even though you're not trying hard, uh, you will begin to realize incredible serenity in your life and out of that serenity are going to come brilliant answers insights wisdom common sense you know more loving relationships and a better rapport with yourself and others so many gifts will emerge from a more serene mind and i encourage you to really um, put some emphasis on this topic because it really is critical to a quality life It's very important to set a positive emotional climate in the family. You know, it's sort of like in a garden. A garden will grow best under certain conditions with the soil and the proper watering and sunlight. And families will thrive in certain emotional climates as well. A lot of people don't put a lot of thought into this subject, and I actually have because I have very specific goals for my family. I would love for my children to grow up feeling loved and feeling as though life is not an emergency. My wife and I share that goal. So we have decided that the proper emotional climate in our home is one of calm. That's our, our overall goal. Now make no mistake about it, it is not always calm in our house. However, it's interesting when you have it as a goal to keep that as the climate, then all of us together work as a family to try to continually make adjustments back toward that goal. So that even the kids know that that's the goal in our house. So when one of us gets a little crazy or if there's too much noise, even our little one, our six-year-old will say, you know, shh, it's too noisy right now, or mommy needs her space, or daddy needs some quiet time, or something like that, because we've determined that a, a feeling of calm is important in our family. Other families have different priorities. Some families, it's very important that they do more things together. Some families feel that it, uh, actually a more competitive environment. Some of our friends with, with a lot of boys will um, talk about the importance of bringing out the competitive spirit within the boys, and they'll have a competitive environment in the home. That would not be my preference. But the point of all this is that you and your spouse and your family have a very powerful tool at your disposal if you choose to, and that is to create the emotional climate that you decide is appropriate for you. I tend, when I'm thinking about families, to focus on the positive in terms of uh, the beauty of, of family and, 
and spending time together. But I think what I notice, unfortunately, is a little bit more of the negative. And probably the most pervasive tendency that I see these days is the tendency for families to be in a very speeded up state. You know, there's never enough time. People are trying to juggle so many things and they're rushing out the door and they're always complaining about not having enough time. One of the hopeful points about this, however, is that so much of it is self-induced. And I have to tell you, I've even created some of this myself in our family. And our goal, again, is to create a feeling of calm. But you tend to get your kids in um, too many activities, for example. You know, they'll be in soccer, and they'll be in ballet, and they'll be in dance, and they're tutoring after school, and they're practicing their flashcards, and they're participating in um, a school play, or whatever the case may be. And I think most most people listening can probably relate to some of that, that there's all these things that we fill up our schedules and we fill up our calendars and we rarely ever say no and we just fill up our lives to the point at which we're just too filled up. We're too busy. And that creates this need to rush around and to feel hurried and pressured. And when you do that, you're really setting the example to yourself and to your spouse and if you have children to them, that life is this mad rush. It's interesting when you're driving in traffic, for example, I look around sometimes and I see people gripping the wheel and they're tightening their necks and they're all uptight. And in fact, it's interesting, one of the ways that uh, the book Don't Sweat the Small Stuff was originally written was that I was driving across the San Francisco Bay Bridge with my daughter, Kenna, and she was very little at the time. And we were in this horrible traffic jam. And she looked out the window and she was just learning how to talk. I can't remember, I two or three years old. And she looked around and she said to me, Daddy, why is everybody so angry? And I said to her, you know what? I don't know. Then again, there's a lot of things I don't know. I don't know why people are so angry about a lot of things. And that was one of the many things that encouraged me to write that book. Because, you know, if you're in traffic and you're all uptight about it and your kids are with you in the car, what you're really showing them, what you're teaching them is the psychological message that if life isn't perfect, it's appropriate to be upset. And what I've learned is that there's so many things like this that are so unconscious to us. You know, when somebody criticizes you in public or someone steps in front of you in line at a theater or the grocery store or the post office and you flip out and your child watches that, that's what you're teaching them. That, oh, okay, if life isn't perfect, I should be upset and the goal is to have everybody accommodate me all the time. And, of course, that's never going to happen. I think the mistake that so many of us make is that we respond or rather react out of anger or frustration and we'll say, you know what bugs me about you? And we'll we'll go on to give some sort of unasked for lecture. But I'm yet to meet someone who really appreciates being lectured to, uh, yelled at, accused of things. Most of the time people don't respond to that kind of interaction by saying, oh, thank you very much for sharing that with me. I'm really glad that you yelled at me and and showed me no respect. And it just doesn't happen that way. So, you know, that's pretty obvious when you think about it. But it's still important, I think, to remind ourselves that the best way to resolve any sort of family conflict is to get yourself in the proper emotional space to engage in the interaction to begin with, because then people are receptive to what you have to say. We talked earlier about what I will call waiting for a positive feeling or looking for a positive feeling in relationships. And to me, probably the only way to effectively resolve a family conflict is to do so with a positive feeling, whether you gather your family together for a family meeting or whether you're one-on-one with one of your children or your spouse or a sibling or, or whatever the case may be, that the idea is that when you can speak to your family member heart to heart, when you can have rapport and respect and you can be a good listener and you're coming from that positive feeling where the person you're speaking to feels that resolve and that love coming from you, then they are inclined to listen and you're inclined to listen back. There are unlimited opportunities in life to criticize other people, particularly our family members because we spend so much time around them. Yet I think it's really important that we resist the urge to criticize because, you know, if you think about it, when you criticize someone, it's not really saying all that much about the other person that you're criticizing. It really is speaking more to your own need to 
be someone who criticizes. You're just offering an opinion. But when you look at what happens as a result, if you think about how you feel after you criticize someone and what that really feels like, uh, you'll notice that it kind of brings you down. It makes you feel bad. Um, it makes the other person feel bad. It makes them doubt themselves. It makes them defensive and argumentative and want to criticize you back. And it sets this spiral in motion that is not very healthy. Obviously, there are times when you need to point things out to people or make suggestions or make comments. But again, that gets back to the feeling you're coming from. Do you have permission to give someone a suggestion. Oftentimes you can ask. You can say, would you like my feedback? And I'd be happy to share it with you. And if the person says, no, I really don't want your feedback or I'm not interested, it's a good idea to respect that. But if they offer you permission and say, sure, I'd like to hear what you have to say, then you can say, well, this is what I've noticed about you. And you can go on and say it. And the difference can be very subtle. But in one instance, you're offering constructive advice. And in another, you're being very attacking. And um, I think the extent to which we can resist the urge to criticize will strengthen our family relationships a great deal. I've never met a single family member who said to me in private that, gee, um, my parents didn't criticize me enough, or my sister or my brother didn't criticize me enough. It's always the opposite. It was, it's always things like, boy, my family is so critical of me, or my sister is so critical of me, or my brother, or my father, or my, my spouse. And nobody likes it, yet people keep on doing it. And yet, if we can resist the urge, great things will start to manifest in our relationships, no doubt. I just don't know that very many good things come out of criticizing other people. Blaming others is really an exercise in futility because when you blame others, you're not taking any responsibility. It's very difficult for any sort of resolution or problem solving to take place when you're blaming others and you're pointing the finger and you're saying, it's not my fault. And I think it's far more effective to ask yourself the question, is there any way in which I'm contributing to this problem? And if there is, to go ahead and try to make a change or solve the problem or take some form of action. And if there isn't, offer any sort of assistance that you might in helping to determine the best way to solve the problem. But this idea of blaming others is something very similar to criticism where nobody appreciates it. Nobody ever wants to um, be blamed for something. And the truth is, if someone is open to the fact that they have contributed to a problem, they will step forth and admit it. And uh, no amount of me or you or anybody else blaming them is going to bring that out in them. So it's just overall bad idea that brings people down and puts a distance between yourself and the other members in your family. Another thing I'd like to talk about now is the concept called weatherproofing. And this concept actually comes from a friend of mine up in the Seattle area. And what it means is that you know how when you move into a house and you love it at first, and you're all excited to be there, whether it's an apartment or a home, and you're appreciating it, and you're enjoying it, and you've been there for a little while, and all of a sudden you start to notice the little quirks in it. You know, you'll notice the leaks, and you might fix them, and you'll notice the window needs to be replaced, and you fix that, and the carpet's not quite right, so you start fixing that. I call that weatherproofing. You start noticing the furniture's not quite right, and the drapes aren't right, and pretty soon it becomes a way of thinking in your life. You're weatherproofing your house. Now, technically, weatherproofing is actually what it sounds like. It's trying to keep the weather elements outside and not affect you so much. So there's a, there's a place for it, certainly. But in your relationships, weatherproofing implies this idea, as in your house, of picking it apart. You know, you meet someone for the first time. Think back to the time you met your significant other and you just absolutely adore them. And if they were 10 minutes late, as in my case, when my wife, who at the time, of course, wasn't my wife, when I first met Chris, I would take the time that she was late to read books. I thought, this is great. Oh, it's just charming that she's late some of the time. It's a, a nice quality, and we we're very different. And I would notice all these things about her that were just charming and wonderful, and I just accepted her exactly as she was. And a little time goes by, and pretty soon you say to yourself, you know, this person's late a lot of the times. I think I'll bring it up to her. So you bring it up, and and she says, wow, okay, I'll try not to be late so often. So she um, is late a few more times, and you bring it up again. And so they stop being so late. 
but yet secretly they're getting a little resentful because you're no longer accepting them as they are. You're now wanting them to be different. And pretty soon it becomes a way of life. It's not just that they're late. It's the way that they dress or it's the fact that you don't want them spending time with their friends and it's the habits that they have. It's the way they eat. It's what they eat. It's how they spend their time. It's pointing out their quirks. And pretty soon if you look around at people, you'll notice that there is this incredible tendency that we all have, most of us anyway, to weatherproof people. We're always on the lookout. It's like we have this antenna. What's wrong with this person? What are they saying wrong? What are they doing wrong? And if you listen to conversations privately, as I do sometime at restaurants, so those of you who, if you ever see me in a restaurant, beware. I listen to conversations to get material for books. It's unbelievable to me how often people will say, you know what's wrong with Jane or you know what's wrong with Bob? And you just go on and on and on about all these problems that these people have and all the things that they could do to be better. And it's just a habit. And I think it's a very insidious habit that people have, particularly in the family. People will do things in their own family very innocent things. You'll break something, for example. It's an accident. Now, if a friend of yours came over to your house and broke something insignificant, you'd probably say, oh, don't worry about it. I'll just you know, sweep it up and it's no big deal. We didn't even like that thing anyways. But if your child did the very same thing, you'd probably point out to he or she how clumsy they were and how often they break things and you're wishing they were different and you're not accepting them the way they are. So it's this, this whole notion of demanding that people be different and your obsession with looking at what's wrong with them. That's what I call weatherproofing. Now, the way to stop weatherproofing is just to admit that you do it. That's all you have to do. You just admit that you are a person like everybody else. I do it too. You probably do. That weatherproofs people. If you make a commitment to catch yourself doing it, you will stop doing it so much. And believe me, folks, everyone loves it when you stop doing this. Nobody likes to be weatherproof. Nobody has ever come up to me and said, you know what? I think it's great that my husband picks me apart. And nobody ever says that. Again, just like being criticized, it falls into the same general category. So be on the lookout for weatherproofing in yourself. Make a commitment to stop doing it so much, and you'll be amazed at how the quality of your relationships in your family will begin to get better and better. Something else that I think is so incredibly important, and I think it's one of the most obvious concepts that I ever talk about in my books, is that it's absolutely a great idea to be willing to learn from your friends and family. And if you step back for a moment, you think about how obvious this is, your friends and your family know you so well. They know your quirks. They know your idiosyncrasies. They're aware of maybe blind spots, things that you can't see that you're doing to yourself, ways that you're stumbling, ways that you're getting in your own way. And yet your friends and family most likely are the people that you're least willing to listen to. Why? Probably because you're a little bit defensive or you're tired of hearing about it or you're frightened to admit that you could learn from someone close to you or whatever. I don't know what the reason is, but I can tell you that for sure that I have friends in my own circle of influence and friendships that people who will never in a million years would never take advice from me or from my wife or from anybody in our family that sometimes you can actually see things so well you could just point to them one simple thing one simple change they could make in their life that would really turn them around and make their life easier and i think that one of the greatest assets i personally have in my life is i've always been willing to learn from my friends and family i'll ask my dad to this day i'll say hey can you give me advice on this financial issue or or did you see that talk that i did last week what do you think i'm doing wrong can you give me a suggestion i know that he's got great advice to give me and if you can just avoid the tendency to be defensive you can learn a lot from the people who love you most and I think, again, there's a lot of reasons why people don't do it. But if you can just sort of swallow your pride and ask your spouse, your spouse knows you better than anybody, you know, can you think of ways that I could improve myself? Do you see ways that I'm getting in my own way? And they will tell you. And if you just avoid the tendency to become defensive and to get annoyed and bothered by their comments, you can learn a lot and it can really help your life. I'd like to talk for just a few minutes about love and the family and the importance of loving and expressing love and receiving love and just having an overall feeling of love in the family. You know, it's interesting, um, as I speak to people all over the country, I'm yet to hear a single person tell me, you know, when I was little and I was living with my family, my father told me way too often how much he loved me 
or my mom just was always telling me so much how much she loved me. Nobody ever says that. I can't imagine a person ever falling into that category. It's usually just the opposite. It's very sad, but you will hear a lot of times people saying that I never was told that I was loved and, and I wasn't told enough that I was loved. And there's just something so incredibly beautiful about being sure to tell the people in your family how much you love them. I don't know very many things definitively, but one thing I am certain about in my family is that my wife and I tell our two children frequently and often how much we love them. We want them to feel loved growing up. We want them to know that they are loved. Even when we're mad at them, even if they're in the room for a time out or if we're having some time apart, we will always, always, always go up to them afterwards and remind them how much we love them and apologize if need be if we overreacted. There's just something so incredibly enriching and nourishing about a family where people tell each other, they write each other notes about how much they love each other, they leave each other voicemail messages or on the answering machine and they tell each other to their face first thing in the morning and, and before bed at night and during the day. And there's just no downside to the whole um, notion of reminding people frequently how much you love them. Along the same lines, it's, it's really important that you never take anyone for granted, but particularly your spouse and your children. You know, it's so easy to forget that our spouse and the people that we live with need our support and they need to be appreciated and it's so often the case that you know imagine what would happen if you went over to a friend's house and they made you a real delicious dinner you know or they cleaned your house for you or they worked all day like 12 hours to bring home money to pay your bills whatever the case may be you would be so incredibly grateful you'd say wow I can't believe you just took all your time and energy to make me this delicious meal I'm, I'm so grateful I wow you made my bed and 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 did my laundry and or, wow, you worked all day to, to help me out. That's just so incredibly generous of you. I'm just so blessed and grateful. But if your spouse did the very same thing, if he or she works all day, or if he or she prepares the meals for the family or takes care of the children, uh, and it can be the husband or the wife in, in this instance, most likely you take some of that for granted. And it's such a shame. And Chris and I have been married for a long time now, and I know that one of the things that keeps us... Um, together so closely is is Chris's incredible appreciation. I, I don't think I've ever felt taken for granted. It's just an amazing thing. And, and I try very hard not to take her for granted ever. If she's spent an entire day with our two children, it can be tough to spend time with children all day long, you know, and I remember that. And and I spent a lot of time with them myself. And I try to thank her and, and genuinely ask her about her day and, and want to find out about it and what it was like and really remind her how grateful I am that, my goodness, I'm so lucky to have you in my life. And it's just something, it's so simple, you know, it's almost embarrassing to talk about because you'd think that, God, doesn't everybody do this? And yet, they don't. I mean, I see people in my own friendships and I, I see husbands who absolutely take their wives for granted. I see wives take their husbands for granted. It really isn't one way or the other in this instance. It's people taking each other for granted. And it's just a shame. And people assuming their children are always gonna be there, you know? And then your kids grow up and you say, yeah, almost everyone says, if I would have done it over again, or if I could do it over again, I would do it so differently. I'd express more appreciation. But if you know that in advance, why not just start now? You know, start appreciating your kids now. And there's certainly a challenge, but boy, is it a gift to have a family. And I think if you can write a lot of notes and gratitude notes, as I call them, and, and spend a lot of time being grateful, it just enhances the overall quality of your life and your family. And um, everybody ends up the winner. You know, there's a lot of things that, that people can do to um, show each other how much we love each other. Sometimes in the home, it can be something as simple as recognizing something that your children or your spouse doesn't like to do. For example, in my family, Chris, the thing that she least likes to do is the dishes. That's just something that she does. She does tons of the housework, and she does more of it than I do, but she just doesn't really like to do the dishes. So when I'm home, I go out of my way to be the person to do the dishes. She knows that. She knows that the primary reason I'm doing that is because it makes her life easier. She does lots of things like that. For me, I hate doing laundry, but if she's around, she'll almost always do my laundry. 
laundry for me, homework with the kids. You can spend extra time with your children or taking them on special outings. We call them dates at our house. We love to spend one-on-one time with our two girls, you know, all of us. We'll take separate vacations with the kids. We'll do separate dates with the kids. Uh, We think one-on-one time is essential. So anything that you can do that is special, not so much to you, but to the other person. Of course, a lot of times there's a lot of overlap as well, where something that's special to your daughter or son is going to be special to you too. But think of the other person. Think of the things that they would like to do and and reach out and, and do those things for them. And And almost always that comes back in the way of more loving relationships. Something I should tell you about my own personal friends is that they're such quality people. You know, it's hard to tell stories about one and not the other because I have so many wonderful friends. But I have uh, one friend in particular who happens to live in the state of Minnesota who is probably about the most loving person that, that I've ever known. And it's just interesting. He just refuses to let outside influences affect the feelings of love that he has in his heart. So it's like he can't be dragged down. He doesn't get thrown off center. You know, he's almost like a a spider in his web. You know, he just is so secure in that feeling of love. And he's got lots of cousins and he has a son and now he's going to soon have a grandchild and he's got a loving marriage and he's got all these relatives and everybody's always going to see him and everybody wants to be around him because he just exemplifies these feelings of love. And some people just don't recognize that this is actually a possibility for all of us. You know, that if you make love a priority, if you make anything a priority in your life, if you make jogging a priority, you'll probably spend a lot of time jogging. If you make cooking a priority in your life, you'll probably become a great chef. But if you create the space and the desire to have love in your heart as your top priority, you'll find that it will become so. And you'll start to see that you have the capacity to make loving decisions and to have loving reactions and to become non-defensive and to become a better listener and to make love a top priority. And when you do, uh, voila, like magic, you become very good at it. And pretty soon, you know, a little annoyance will come your way or someone will do something wrong or your child will say the wrong thing or your spouse will say the wrong thing. And you'll just find that yourself forgiving them. You'll find yourself not wanting to be thrown off center simply to follow some negative train of thought that's going to bring you somewhere you don't want to go. You'll find yourself able to stay in that feeling of love. And when you do, almost everything else magically takes care of itself. You know, it's been said that love is the most important answer in life, and I certainly agree with that. To me, the power of forgiveness is so incredible and so important and also so ridiculous to not participate in forgiveness. You know, I think to be a person who's unforgiving is, is so silly in a way because it really implies that, you know, I'm perfect and I never make mistakes and I never do anything wrong and I always say the right thing and I never offend anybody and I never blow it or stumble or act stupid or anything else and never make mistakes. And, and that's sort of what it seems like when someone says, well, I could never forgive her. I could never forgive him. He said the wrong thing or he offended me. It's just silly. I mean, when you forgive someone fully and lovingly, it it gives you a fresh start. It reminds us of our humanness. I think forgiveness is something that I've always found very easy because, again, going back to my own stumbling, I mean, I think of all the thousands of times in my life that I've been forgiven, you know, when I've made mistakes or when I said the wrong thing or whatever. My wife, Chris, is probably the most forgiving person I've ever met in my life. She'll get really mad, and then about 10 minutes later, she forgives me, and then everything's fine again. And, and it just makes your life so much easier. You know, you'll, you'll see people who are hanging on to their anger and hanging on to their guilt and hanging on to this and that. And it just it's the epitome of not living in the moment, of not being present. You're always focused on something that happened five years ago in your family, and I'm just not going to let this go, and you're going to carry it around with you for the rest of your life. I mean, think about that for a minute think about what that implies. It implies that here you are in the present moments of your life, zeroed in on something that happened five years ago or in your childhood or 10 years ago or or yesterday. You know, it's like my mind is filled up with all these hateful and hurtful thoughts instead of being appreciative for the moment that I have. And that doesn't mean you're advocating negative behavior or you're pretending that everything's okay when people do things that they shouldn't do. But it does suggest that it's really possible to forgive people because people are people. And uh, I think it was Zorba the Greek that said, hey, you know what, we're the whole catastrophe. And that includes 
the fact that we are mistake makers and that's part of life. And so I think it behooves all of us to forgive people as much as we possibly can. And so a lot of it gets back to appreciation of taking your focus off of what's wrong in your life and what's wrong with your spouse and your family and your parents and everybody else and saying, hey, you know what? We're all in this together. You know, we're all human beings and we all blow it. We all make mistakes, plenty of them. I can attest to that. And yet when we learn to forgive, it also opens the door for others to forgive us. I know that, you know, with my kids, um, it's very easy to get mad at your kids, but it's also easy to forgive them very shortly afterwards. But we've taught our kids in our family that, you know, we're your parents, but we're also human beings, and we're going to blow it sometimes, and we're going to get too angry or too reactive. And our kids are learning early on to, that they forgive us quickly. You know, it's great. I mean, we can just be humans together, the four of us growing together as a family. So the power of forgiveness is awesome. It changes everything in your life. It keeps you from hanging on to all this nonsense that's over. Life is just a, a series of moments, you know, one after another, as we've discussed already in this session. And the more you can forgive, the more quality you're going to bring to each present moment as it arrives. I've noticed that one of the most consistent questions that I receive from people as I do book signings and lectures around the country is this one of how does one balance the responsibilities of family and career? Everybody wants to know the secrets. How do you juggle all this stuff that we all have to do? There's so many responsibilities and we've all got so many things to do. How do you balance all of this? And in a way, it's um, difficult to to share this with you because what I found is that you really can't balance family and career. There's there's really no way to balance it effectively. If you think about it, what are you going to do? Schedule 8.2 hours doing this and 8.1 doing this and, and hope that it all works out. I mean, it's just, in a way, it's almost silly. The best that a person can do is really become as present as possible in all that one does with family and career. The problem is that people will engage in a career and they'll be working all day and they'll get home and they're tired and they're preoccupied. So they'll come in the door and their mind's still at work. Now they're not at work anymore, but they're thinking about their deadlines and they're thinking about being chewed out that day and they're thinking about the nasty comment they heard and they're thinking about the meetings tomorrow and next week's flight and the presentation they're gonna have to make and all these things that are going on. Now, none of this is real. It's all going on in the person's mind. Now, the truth is they are gonna have to do these things and these things did in fact happen. But right now, as they're walking in the home to see their family, it's just all going on in their mind. And they walk in the door, and the family can tell immediately. I mean, your children, your spouse, the people you live with know immediately if you're right there with them or not. And the trick is to really learn how to center yourself and to be right where you are, wherever you happen to be. And I, again, this is something that I just for some reason not had a huge problem with but boy I sure see it in a lot of people when I go home I'm home I mean I I couldn't care less about my work at home and when I'm at work I'm really right there doing my work and then when work's over I'm going and doing something else and it gets back to this notion that life is a series of moments but the trick is to be in that moment when you're at home and you're with your family even if your spouse is upset with you because you got home late again if you can dismiss the criticism and just be right there with the person, pretty soon your spouse is forgiving you. They're not on your back all night. They're only on your back for like the first two minutes for being late. Or your kids, how come you got home so late, Daddy? Well, I'm right here with you guys. What do you want to do? What should we do tonight? Let's spend some time together. And if you're right there and you're focused and you're loving, your kids are going to embrace you. Your spouse is going to embrace you. You're going to have a good time. You're going to be right there. And in fact, you are then balancing your work and your family and your career. And it all happens that way by virtue of you really being present with where you are. And again, the opposite of that is going to work in the morning and you had an argument with your spouse and you're at work and you can't get your mind off of it. And so you're grumpy with other people and you're not very productive and you're working poorly. and You're not concentrating and you're thinking about calling your spouse to apologize, but you're not sure that you should. And so you're sort of back home and now you're at work. So it's far more important to be present 
than it is to try to balance things that really can't be balanced. So again, it all stems from this ability to create a sense of presence in your life. Another thing I like to suggest is a little trick that I learned a while back, and that is to include plenty of what I like to call white space in your calendar. There is this hope that so many families have and so many people have that when they get everything done, it's going to work out great because then they're going to be able to take a vacation or spend a half day by themselves browsing in a bookstore or taking that yoga class or having a date with their child or with their spouse or with their significant other. You know, everything's going to get taken care of and then I'm going to go ahead and do these wonderful things. I'm going to volunteer time or I'm going to take a stretching class or whatever the case may be. I'm going to read that book, you know, when everything gets done. Unfortunately, this rarely happens. You know, the calendar just has this mysterious way of filling up all the time. You're never finished with your responsibilities. You're never finished with everything that you have to do. There's always some responsibility, something to take care of, something breaks, someone's sick, someone has to go to the doctor. Um, it's just all the time something's going on. And you finally get a little white space in your calendar or there's a date that's free in your calendar and then your neighbors call you up and say, hey, can you come over for a barbecue on Saturday? And you go, oh, sure, here's some space in my calendar. Sure, I can come over on Saturday. And so you check it down on the calendar and then you say to yourself, later, how come I never have any time for myself? So something that I do in my calendar at work is I um, schedule in plenty of what I'll call white space. I'll X out certain days or half days, months and months and months down the road. And therefore, there is nothing, I mean absolutely nothing short of a dire emergency that's going to take the place of that white space. I treat it like any other important appointment, like a speaking engagement or a trip to my doctor. It is my time or my family's time, and there is nothing that's going to get in the way. So then when someone says, could you do something for me on this specific date, I look at my calendar, and if there's an X in the calendar, no way, I'm sorry, I've already got plans. I have no need to justify it. I used to, I used to feel guilty because it looked like I had some time there. But what I found was if I didn't do this, if I didn't schedule in the white space, I never had any. And so many people will do that. They'll say, um, you know, I don't have any time to myself, but someone will cancel an appointment, creating some time in their calendar, and then they'll get a phone call five minutes later and they'll fill up the space. But what you can do instead is just etch it out. Say, okay, August 19th in the afternoon, that's my time. I don't care what comes up. I'm not doing it. Then people will say to me, well, isn't that expensive? You know, what if something really great comes up, some great opportunity? I don't look at it that way. I don't think you can put a price on your free time. I mean, if you want to have a peaceful life, if you want to have a happy family life, you have to create time for your family and for yourself. For some people, it's Sundays, you know. For other people, it's Wednesday afternoons. But there has to be some time that's reserved for you. And I think if you put a little creativity and ingenuity into this one, you'll find that it serves you very well. Creating miracles in your family is a lot easier done, I think, than said, believe it or not. It's all about not taking the people in your family for granted. It really is that simple. It's about taking the time with the people in your family, of really being truly right there with them. I remember some just touching stories in my own family life with my children, for example, that have always stuck with me and my kids. One time I had a, a dreadful case of the flu with my, um, my oldest daughter, and she had it at the same time. So we decided that we would sleep in the same room together and not get Chris and Kenna sick as well. And just being there with something as distasteful as the flu, both of us throwing up and feeling sick and having a horrible night, just being there and being willing to be there together in the simplest of, of ways, in the most helpless of ways, uh, was something that to this day my daughter remembers. She refers to it often. She said to me that night, she said, Daddy, I will never forget this. Thank you so much for, for being here with me and sleeping in my room with me. Another time with my youngest daughter, we had these big plans. You know, we were going to go to the park and, and play. And I was finding myself a little bit impatient and looking at my watch and getting ready to go. And we were in this parking lot, and she looked down at this big pile of rocks, and, and she just became mesmerized by these rocks. She must have been three years old or something. And I found myself impatient and impatient and impatient, and all of a sudden I realized that, wait a minute, she didn't want to go to the park. She wanted to play with these rocks. And I sat down there on the ground with her for probably 45 minutes or an hour, and just looked at these little rocks together and how fascinating they were. And it was the simplest, the most incredibly simple experience, but it was one of the most beautiful experiences I can remember with either of my children. And to this day, 
my daughter that I did that with is someone who is absolutely fascinated in the simplest of things. I mean, she is incredibly fascinated by the process of picking up litter off the ground if someone else dropped it, or looking at graffiti you know, that gang members might write. It's just unbelievable. She'll go, what does that mean, Dad? And she'll just go study it, and she'll be really interested in it, or playing music, or reading a book, or whatever it might be. I think the simple things in family are the, are the most important. People put an awful lot of attention and emphasis on these big family vacations they're going to take, and they go into debt, and they plan these things for months and months. And, and yet, you know what? Most of life is not spent on vacation. Most of life is spent in the mornings, when you're hurried, getting ready for work or whatever. And if you can really begin to appreciate the incredible miracle of just having a family and waking up and playing with them and trying not to get flustered and trying to get out the door and in a calm, collected way. And if you succeed a little bit, you smile and you appreciate it. And if you don't, you forgive yourself. And your day just becomes so rich because it's all like a big game that you're playing. And I, I think the more you play it, the better you get at it. And so I think to create miracles in the family, it's most important to focus on these everyday events because that's really what life is made of.